Hello everyone, welcome to this new mini-series on the colonial history of the Netherlands and how it is reflected in literature. I think there might be three reasons why you could be interested in these videos. The first one is because you just want to get to know more Dutch classics, you know, books that are in the canon and that have stayed there for a reason. We're going to talk about a handful of those, starting today with uh, Uruch. The second reason is that you might be interested in history and the history of colonialism. And maybe you believe, like me, that history is best told through the eyes of individuals and that writing is a magnificent tool to bring across the happenings of a specific time in history. So this is going to be a very history heavy episode. And I know quite some people who have gone to school in the Netherlands and they said they never learned about these things. The third reason is that maybe you're interested in studying literature and you're curious what a course in literature looks like and what one actually learns at university. And so this is the content of one of the courses I am taking in this semester, my first semester. So, you know, I'm really trying to compromise it down to a few hours mm, uh, because it has it has been a, sort of a huge course with many classes and a lot to read to research and to prepare and um, yeah and I'm making this video sort of out of a bit of a selfish reason because I have um, my exam in two weeks and I thought, what better way to learn all of this than to try to make videos about it and explain it to someone else. Just a disclaimer, you know, please know that I'm not, I'm not studying history, I'm not studying politics. So if I'm using the wrong wording for something, uh, please excuse me and know that I'm not doing that to offend anyone. And if you're new here, hello, welcome. I'm so glad that you're watching this video. My name is Maria and I study European languages and literature at the University of Vienna. And that is my passion. That is what I'm interested in. And that is what I am talking about on this channel. So if you're not already, I would love for you to subscribe and let's get into the video. So as a short overview of the next three videos, um, we're gonna in this video talk about the Dutch East Indies, so the colonization of what today is Indonesia. And as I said, we're gonna talk about Hela Haase, Louis Coperus, Jeroen Brouwers. Um, in the next episode, we're gonna talk about the West Indies, so the colonization of uh, South America, specifically Suriname, but also the islands uh, like Aruba. And uh, that, you know, especially Suriname has a very dark history of slavery. And it that was really the part that personally hit me the most. Um, and also where I enjoyed the literature the most from. So I'm very excited to talk about Suriname. And that country also has a very interesting history in terms of language and the languages that are spoken there today and the people who live there and from what backgrounds they come from. And, you know, slavery there was only abolished 150 years ago, which is not that long if you think about it. Yeah, and in part three, I want to talk about how that colonial past still influences the present in the Netherlands today. We're gonna, you know, look at how it affects people in the colonies, Dutch citizens, politicians, what politicians are trying to do um, to work through these issues slowly. Uh, we're going to look at some traditions and statues that are under debate and just look at the overall problem of racism and, and slavery and imperialism and how they still play out in some ways. 
yeah, just as a short note, South Africa was actually never a colony of the Netherlands. Um, a lot of Dutch people went there and they eventually gained power, but it was never actually a colony. So just to get that out of the way. One last point of caution that I would like to give before we get into the East Indies is that it is very easy to judge what has happened um, through our present understanding and through our current view of things. So I invite you to seek to understand as many sides of history as possible and to sort of refrain your judgment even for just a moment and realize that, you know, the people that made decisions and were in those situations also had to make these decisions for a certain reason. You know, they also had to survive. The Netherlands needed money. <laughs> um, you know, if, if we would have been in their skin, we might have made the same decision. So, you know, maybe don't immediately jump the gun. Of course, it's horrible. I'm not saying that to excuse anything, but I think it's much more helpful to just be curious about the human condition and, you know, how we're all doing things like that in in a sort of similar way, maybe in our own lives, maybe in our in a small way. So the first question we have to ask ourselves when we're talking about this topic of colonization is how did it all start? You know, who had the idea of going overseas to other countries, trading with them, uh, working plantations, right? So let's have a bit of a look on the historical background of the Netherlands before we go into our first novel. So early on, even before 1600, 1600, there were already settlements of the Dutch in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, China and Japan. But they were usually very short-lived. It, it was only a few Dutch citizens, you know, in, in, in some houses and, and it didn't last very long. Those people didn't have a lot of power at all. But around 1600, they started trading with Indonesia and slowly established some trading posts there. But, you know, at first it didn't have much impact at all. So the first phase sort of of colonialism was just the trading, right? It was a, a purely commercial form of colonialism, so to say. So a bit later, it went over to plantations and the Dutch tried to influence what was planted in the plantations. The Dutch actually moved there themselves and became the owners of plantations and had uh, locals working for them. And the third phase was a sort of imperialist form of colonialism where the moral view of the Dutch themselves was seen as, you know, standing higher because they're part of the Western civilization and they needed to educate the less developed countries. So that is a very rough outline um, of how it went. So, you know, in the beginning, not much was going on. Also, not a lot of people were willing to move from the Netherlands to the other side of the world, especially women were very hesitant to do that. You know, the journey took several months, I think close to a year actually by ship all the way around uh, Africa. So, you know, it sort of had a bit of a slow beginning. And we're coming to our first book here. Just before we do that, I want to recommend you an article by Geert Ostenlinde. Uh, I'm gonna try and I'll write the name here on the screen. Uh, if you want a very wonderful overview of everything I'm talking about here historically, I really recommend his article. Um, but anyway, so the first uh, book I want to talk about is Hella Hase's De Heren van de Thee. This book is translated to English by Ina Rilke and it's called The Tea Lords. And you'll see why this is 
important for us here is because it beautifully reflects this first phase of colonialism of the Dutch sort of just arriving there trying to find their way in this very strange land with the you know to them strange people and our main character in the book is Rudolf he's a young ambitious Dutch man that moved with his mother to the colony and starts planting coffee on a colonized piece of land and that land has to first be prepared for planting coffee you know it's wild and you can beautifully observe already in that the dichotomy between the beautiful land on the one hand you know the the jungle the wonderful nature but also the harsh sides the storms the wild land that is so difficult to access on the other hand and Hella has it as that quite wonderfully and in her novels it always almost seems like the the weather conditions are a character in and of themselves or they they very wonderfully mirror what is going on within the characters so this book is about Rudolf and his desire to do his own thing you know he has a sense of adventure and he's up for the challenge he's driven by a desire for money and having power over other people and he wants to be his own boss and you know it's it's very early on in the novel he has to measure his plantation he's measuring the land and thereby tries to bring it under control you know which is a very western approach of of making something our own you know we have to measure everything <laughs> so it is written through the eyes of a, of the white colonialist but what's interesting is how he sees the indigenous people and how they're portrayed through his lens you know he often judges them as being lazy and they only work when they have to and they just want to smoke his good tobacco they're naive and they put Rudolf on a pedestal they're easy to manipulate you know so the 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 locals they don't really have a voice in this novel other than how Rudolf sees them so overall you can you can see the naivety of this young man who just has sort of no idea about how things work um, and his you know but he he keeps his loneliness because he has to be sort of high up in the hierarchy but the relationship between him and the locals is very twofold because he also cares about them you know he's he knows it's offensive to them to eat a certain kind of meat so he doesn't do it he cares about them when they're sick um, and on the other hand he really demands respect and you know as I said wants to stay up in the hierarchy um, but the division between them isn't as harsh yet as is as it is gonna become later uh, as it plays in the earlier days of colonialism where the two groups aren't quite as separated what is wonderful about this book is how it shows Rudolf as sort of just being very young and naive and not you know not evil it's not this stereotypical image of the cruel colonizer that is taken away um, which I think is important if we talk about these topics because no no human being is just sort of black and white a word about the author Hella Hase was born in 1918 in Batavia Bata which was then the capital of the Dutch East Indies and she moved to the Netherlands as a young woman and she started publishing her fiction in 1945 and many of her books have gained classic status in the Netherlands yeah I just have that from like the first page of the the tea lords there's an introduction about her and she herself grew up in the East Indies you know she was 
of Dutch parents, but she grew up in the in the East Indies and she considers herself Indish. So if you're interested in reading this book, I saw that on Amazon you can sort of have a look inside the book and read the first few pages. You know, maybe it piques your interest in that way. But I want to zoom in a little bit on that relationship between the oppressor and the oppressed. And that division that in the beginning wasn't quite as strong. We see how it develops when we look at our next book, which is Louis Coupero's The Hidden Force. The original title is De Stille Kracht. And this is the book that I next want to talk about. And the fact is that, as I said, for a long time, this division between the Dutch and the local people wasn't quite as distinct because there weren't many women in the colony because they weren't ready to make the travel. However, in 1869, the Suez Channel, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, was made and that made it possible to you know, move around Africa through the north or like go through Africa basically to Indonesia, which made it possible to do the travel uh, in only two to four months. So that made more women arrive there and that made it possible, you know, because then men had a companionship of Dutch women. They... Um, they sort of, you know, could just be amongst each other and have children with Dutch women and sort of keep the race clean. And in the book, The Hidden Force, we have our main protagonist, a man again, who really shows us that few that, you know, <laughs> the white colonialists thought that mm, Indonesia was sort of in decay and they needed to save the country um, and and this like sense of white superiority that came to the colonies uh, that made it sort of it, it made the division bigger and it made children of mixed backgrounds be in a sort of difficult position because if a white Dutch man had a child with an Indonesian woman then if the father recognized the child, it had Dutch status and it could like go to the Netherlands to study and it was officially Dutch, you know, a Dutch citizen. But the mother could never gain that status. And also if the father sort of denied his fatherhood, then the child also wouldn't gain that status. So these sort of difficult situations emerged then and our main character in the hidden forest his name is van oudijk and he's a dutch resident and he's the local governor in the dutch colonial government and he sort of <laughs> you know what he wants is a white dutch european society and family in an exotic background right <laughs> so doesn't want to take over any of the culture he just wants to be there because it's beautiful and the weather is nice uh, but he doesn't want sort of the the groups to mix so the locals they could be servants and nurses and cleaners whatnot but but they say the culture there shouldn't get hold of us and they they had a special way of saying that they said it's need for indian so don't become indian basically and sort of the main thing i want to highlight in this book is the title that already suggests that there is a sort of hidden force so let's unpack that so our main character is an intelligent practical man who's very proud what he lacks, though, is emotional understanding. And he thinks he loves his children, but he barely knows them. <laughs> and he's so practically minded that he has no idea about the emotional underlying turmoil that is brewing underneath the visible life, which makes him 
very one-sided and and it makes him blind to the belief uh, and the emotional life of the locals that he's surrounded with because you know we cannot forget that even if the dutch were in power they were you know the top 0.4 percent of the population and most people living there were indonesian and you know those people had a hope that god will lift up those that were suppressed and that there will be an end to the colony colony and that is the beginning of of the revolution that ended up happening years and years later and our main character in the story sort of doesn't see that coming that you know you get a feeling that in its soul the country and especially the people who have been there have never really been conquered so the dutch may have thought they had things under control and our main character lives in a sort of pretending that things are going to stay a certain way but it's almost like a volcano you know that where the the life and the force is is there but it simply goes unnoticed and then later in the book you know that hidden force unexpectedly starts erupting and that is like a finger pointing to the movement of independence that happened 40 years later so i personally didn't enjoy that book very much i thought that the writing was quite simple and there was a lot of talk about power instead of just showing power which i would have preferred and i feel like the character was very one-dimensional and sort of just portrayed as bad so i personally wouldn't necessarily recommend it but it does show us the realities of a certain shift that took place in the colony and as i said the separation between the groups and the sort of beginning of the independence movement so let's next talk about why the dutch even colonized the east indies there must have been a reason for that right so of course the dutch needed to raise money so it was mostly an economic endeavor because they were in the middle of the 80 year war and if you look at the netherlands as a country it is a very small country back then there were only one to two million people and there is you know not a lot of land compared to the amount of sea so not a lot of agriculture is possible if you just look at at a map of of the netherlands besides that all the countries around them were doing it as well right so they just followed the footsteps of france and spain and they saw that it was profitable you know and they're already close to the sea so they thought let's just join the competition and first they actually wanted to take the northern route to india so if you look at where the netherlands are you could either go south uh, around africa or through africa later or you could sort of go north <laughs> which which sounds like a risky endeavor to us now because we understand that you know there's so much ice and it's so cold up there that you might get stuck but back then they didn't know that and there's actually this story of uh, Willem Barents who was the first man who with a crew tried to take the northern route <laughs> got stuck at Nova Sembla, which is, I think, a Russian island. They sort of just got stuck with the ship because everything was frozen and they had to spend the winter in this ice with barely any food. It was freezing cold. They weren't prepared for it. And there's a movie made about this, if you want to watch it. I think it's just called Nova Sembla. And it's a good movie to watch. I found it entertaining. It might be a little bit glorified, <laughs> you know, with all the ice bear attacks and, and whatnot. But, but it does show you a bit of the background of this national hero of the Netherlands. You know, it's really, there's, there's songs about him and the, the you know, the, 
the sea where he went is still called the Barents Sea, even today. And yeah, he, he was very celebrated. When they came back, they were sort of celebrated as heroes, which is funny because they never actually colonized anything. <laughs> so yeah, I just, I found it a lovely story somehow. Oh yeah, the 2011 movie Nova Sembla is directed by Reinhard Orlemans. So anyways, after this fail, they did decide to follow the Spanish <laughs> and take the route around Africa to Indonesia. And what started as a trading endeavor was actually very expensive to keep up. So it is very high risk to just do these things privately, go on a ship, go somewhere for months, you know, be away for for several years potentially. Because it, as I said, it took like eight months, eight to ten months to go from the Netherlands to the East Indies. So they wanted it to become more of a collective endeavor to, to diminish the risks, so to say. And they founded the United East India Company, short the VOC, and that was found in 1602 already. And that made it possible through private money to finance the travels of the Dutch. So through stocks, you know, every Dutch housewife <laughs> and anyone could buy into the VOC. And that gave them a very high degree of autonomy and that was needed because, again, if you have to go eight months by ship, it's not so easy, you know, without phone and internet or any of that to sort of just check back with home for small details. And we'll see that that is a problem also, also later on with uh, some other points. And also in the Stille Kracht, the hidden force, that is also talked about how how difficult it is to sort of just rely on letters and having to wait a long time for a response. So, you know, when they had military also, they could just make decisions on behalf of the Dutch, but they were technically a private company. And, you know, you really have to say that most of the people in the Netherlands sort of never knew what was going on there. And just to mention another name, uh, Jan Peterson Kuhn was one of the first officials of the VOC and is seen as sort of the founding father of Dutch success. And his statue is heavily under debate and has been, you know, sprayed with, I don't know, genocide and, and things like that. And yeah, slowly people are sort of catching up to the fact that maybe he was not just a hero. <laughs> maybe he also did some horrible things and we should we should start looking at that. So, you know, just in 2018, there was a school in the Netherlands that was the J.P. Koen School. School? 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 <laughs> J.P. Koen School? Thank you. Um, that was that was sort of given another name. But anyways, as the Dutch settled there, you know, they had the locals work for them and the Dutch had say over what was planted because the Dutch weren't too interested in rice. They wanted to plant mostly sugar, coffee, tea and tobacco. And, you know, even if you lived in the colony and you were a Dutch family, you still had sort of your like fry, uh, your potatoes and meat and uh, Indian food was only allowed once a week. You know, don't eat too much rice because you don't want to become like those people. And if we just look at the size of the Dutch East Indies, that is <laughs> sort of a huge amount of land. And you see how many islands there are. We'll see later how that is a problem as well. But just a sheer size, if you sort of overlay um, the East Indies at the time over Europe, you see that they're like sort of as big, almost as big as Europe, you know, which is a huge land to overlook. Okay, let's now get to Uru by Hella Hasse. I'm going to talk about the English translation in a moment, but I just... 
I have to take a moment to just appreciate this edition that I got from my mother-in-law for Christmas. Um, I sent her a message a few weeks back and I asked her to bring Uru from the Netherlands because I knew they were going to visit us for Christmas. And I thought it's easier to get there in a bookshop than it is here. And what she brought me, <laughs> what she brought me is this first edition of Uruk that was given to her father, who was a Frisian poet and writer in 1948. Um, his signature is in here and everything about this just feels so special. I don't know, I just, I never knew Eric's grandfather, but it really starts to feel like I do because every time I get a book that he that was his or I see the works that he translated I just feel such a sense of kinship with him um that is just very beautiful <laughs> I'm so I'm so grateful that you know Eric's mom felt that this book had a good home in my bookshelf and yeah I'm feeling feeling a little bit emotional about it um, but anyways, this book was written right in the middle of the struggle uh, for independence, so in 1948. And the book is about a friendship between two children. There is uh, the son of a Dutch colonist, he doesn't have a name, and an Indonesian boy called Uruk, right? That's the title of the book. And the book beautifully shows how, on the one hand, children don't really care about background and they don't understand hierarchies the same way that, that adults seem to understand them. And they just play with each other. They play with who's around them and they don't care, you know, what, yeah, again, what sort of background you have. And we're getting the Dutch boy's perspective in this book. And he never really cared about the differences between him and his friend. He does notice them and he does describe them. For example, he says that Uru is a lot more muscular than him, that he doesn't talk when adults are around, that he's very sensitive to, to noise, apparently. And what we learn about him is through the difference, differences with our main character. So it's very contrasting, sort of... Um, way of storytelling because they do live different lives to an extent but those differences are stated very matter-of-factly like they're not judging and our narrator in this book loves Uruk and he feels that the friendship has sort of always been there and for our narrator that friendship is based on equality you know he has he's an only child and he sees Uru almost as a brother. And even though the father doesn't approve, of course, because he says the son is spending too much time with Uru, he's, he's not speaking proper Dutch, you know, and and we have that problem again of need for Indian, right? Like, don't don't become too Indis, in, Indian, Indian. But it turns out at the end of the book that they are too different and that they have developed in such different directions which makes it impossible for them to stay together. What I do quickly want to zoom in on is the English translation of this book where the title is The Black Lake. And if you've read the book, you know that pretty early on they go to a black lake. I mean, it's, it's a lake, but it just looks black and it is sort of narrated through the eyes of children as this like dark, mysterious place. And the title is quite genius in English, actually, because a lake, if you think about it, separates the visible world from the invisible world. And the water is a sort of reflection, a mirror, you know, where when you look into it, you only see yourself which is exactly what this book is about, you know. Remember our narrator describing Uruk only in contrast to himself, 
to his own experience. That is so often what we do when we look at other people from other backgrounds or we go to different countries. They only have a life in contrast to our own. And, you know, that reflection is stark. <laughs> like in a lake, that reflection ends up not being very clear, actually. So the book is translated by Ina Rilke again. And it is again the case that on Amazon you can flip through the first pages, see if it resonates with you. It's a very short book. Uh, it's one of those books that is, you know, apparently, someone commented, read in in Dutch schools as, you know, as a teenager. So it's it's very easy to read. I think if you're learning Dutch and you're looking for a good book like this will be this will be a good choice for many reasons. Okay, let's talk about how the colony came to an end, the war and the struggle for independence. So, in the beginning of the 20th century, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, his name was Abraham Kuyper. Kuyper, <laughs> what was wrong with me today? Abraham, Abraham Kuyper, Abraham Kuyper said that it's time to change our politics, right? And he wanted to move towards a more ethical politic, politic, a more ethical towards policies. Oh my God! Now there's a police driving by. <laughs> poli pol pol police politicians. And he asked himself sort of what were the tools that God has given us to uplift the colonies, you know? So there was no mention of maybe we should leave them alone. No. Um, the <laughs> He thought about it in a way of like, okay, how can we help them? So... They concluded to provide healthcare infrastructure and education in a very sort of Western way uh, because they thought they needed to raise them to stand on their own two feet and that it will probably take 400 years. But hey, it's our moral duty to do that, which, of course, is very patronizing. And that sort of led to a lot of self-awareness and to the independence movement. And in the independence movement, there were different parties involved, like the Communist Party and uh, the Party of, of Muslims. And, you know, uh, a sort of independence movement is, <laughs> is always very interesting if you just look at the pyramid of, of hierarchy sort of in a colony, because as I said, only 0.4% of 60 million people in the colony were white Europeans. And Japan actually catalyzed the independence because the Japanese wanted to be big and take over, I think, most of Asia. And they wanted a united Asia under the superior leadership of Japan. And what they needed for that was oil. And Indonesia had oil. So Japan asked the Dutch to please deliver the oil and the Dutch refused and then the Japanese invaded them in 1942. And that was a very strange situation because all of a sudden, if you think about it, <laughs> the white Europeans were an irrelevant group and they used to consider themselves superior but suddenly they were the outcasts and they had to bow for another leader. Now all the colonizers were taken ca captive and amongst other prisoners shipped off to Bangkok. And they were forced to build the Birma Railway under horrible conditions. You know, that they barely had any equipment to do so. They were underfed and apparently as many as 200,000 people, not just Dutch, but like all sorts of uh, people from all countries left their lives in the building of this railway. So it is quite a sad story. We unfortunately didn't go in depth into that at all. Apparently there's a movie about it. Uh, I would love to learn more about that. Seems quite horrible though. That's why I haven't watched the movie. So as I said, when the Japanese invaded, the Dutch were sent to camps. And this is where our next book comes in, Besonken Rot by Jeroen Brouwers. In English it is Sunken Red. 
And the narrator is a man who used to live in a camp like this as a boy. And he describes his memory. And the camp he lived in was a woman's camp, but also, so for girls and women, but also boys under 10 were there with their mothers. And when they reached the age of 10, they had to go into a men's camp. And he describes sort of the condition in this camp, how people were hungry all the time, there were sickness, they were really cramped in, they barely had any privacy. He also describes the sort of psychological torture that was going on there of the Japanese threatening to take their kids away and how they were always wearing the same clothes, how they were very isolated and neglected and they had no idea what was going to happen. And there's a sort of controversy around this book that deals with the problem of fact and fiction because Jeroen Brouwers himself, he was born in 1940 and when he was two years old he was interned into a camp with his mother and his father was in a different camp and the camp he was in has the same name as the camp in the book the family members have the same names uh, as you know in his own biography and the main character has the same name so, so it really suggests a sort of autobiographical approach but Jeroen Brauers was accused of having enlarged the suffering he's describing in the camp because there are facts that he's mentioning in the book for example specific architectural features that were never found any evidence for and some say that he sort of just projects a german nazi camp onto his own experience and a lot of people say that you cannot play with these facts or you cannot over empathize things in this in this context and that he's just sort of calling upon an image that he knew would resonate with a lot of people. But that, of course, brings up the question, what is truth and what is a true account of something? You know, isn't history always sort of also subjective? And especially memory and the memory of a child could just be very different than, you know, how a history book would sort of write it down. And how important is it that those facts in the book are historically accurate? Does it really add to the reading experience? You know, that's questions to think about. I would, I would love to hear your thoughts if you would like to share them in the comments with me. And Brauers himself sort of plays with that blurred line by saying that, yes, you can read this piece as a documentary, as autobiographical fiction you know, which is again a sort of gray zone between fact and fiction. And he, what's most important to him is to just speak out about these topics because he says that people have kept quiet about this for way too long. They tried to soften it. And, you know, with the war going on, with the Second World War going on in, in all of Europe and in the Netherlands as well, people thought that there was nothing bad going on on the other side of the world and and when people came back from from Japan from well from Asia and and all the things happening there the the locals in the Netherlands said yeah be glad you weren't here you know because of course the the Germans have been quite brutal to the to the Dutch as well but there was never really any room to work through what happened to these people and and he is sort of the person who wants to shed light on that. What's different about this book is that it doesn't describe the Dutch East Indies as a as a beautiful paradise, you know, that one has nostalgia for. Brouwer says he has no desire to go back there and, and no nostalgia for that place, obviously. So anyways, the Japanese invaded the colony in 1942 and the war ended with you know, the dropping of, of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And after that, there were four years of fighting for the independence of Indonesia. And in that a war, over 100,000 Indonesians were killed. And there were sort of so many groups of people fighting against each other. 
and the Dutch tried to like law and order the total chaos. At least that's what it was portrayed as. And they tried to get the power back, right? They didn't want to lose the colony and they got the help of military to do so. But in the end, the Dutch lost the colonial war in 1949 and the independence was celebrated. And why this is also not talked about a lot is the difficulty of talking about a war that you've lost, you know, and what it is like to be sort of on the wrong side of history. And only later in the 1970s, the debate came up about these war crimes that happened and the thousands and thousands of people that have died in that war of independence and Dutch veterans were furious of course because they were ordered to fight by the Dutch government um, so there was sort of this tension there of you know we have done this ourselves but also we didn't really so the government sort of gave the orders but they also didn't really know what was happening there so they concluded that it wasn't war crimes that happened there. It was just unfortunate ex excesses. So, you know, um, a thorough investigation is sort of lacking. I'm, I'm sort of putting a pin into that for the moment because in the third video of this series, I want to talk more about what, what happened after independence and how how the war crimes were like slowly discovered about what happened to the people that moved back to the Netherlands and so on and so forth. And in Indonesia, the government doesn't seem to have a specific interest in that period. And it almost seems like the Dutch didn't really leave a trace there in, in terms of language or culture, which is interesting and very different from you know, Suriname, which we'll see in the next video. So I think I'm going to leave it at that. You know, they clung to Indonesia for so long because the Dutch also thought that <laughs> Indonesia was not ready to stand on their own feet. You know, there's, there's many rationalizations going on in the background. But anyways, I'm going to round off this video here. Thank you a lot for watching. If you have any questions or anything to say about that, uh, please tell me in the comments below. I hope that I could deliver this topic in a respectful way. I really do hope so. And I'm looking forward to talking about Suriname next week. I really, really do. Okay. Thank you a lot. Um, I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.